Right. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon, I should say, I guess. Uh, we've had a really good morning this morning, and I've, uh, I've actually enjoyed uh, all of this, the uh, talks this morning. I learned a lot, and I hope you have too. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's uh, kind of nerve-wracking to come in after lunch, and hopefully none of you are in uh, carb comas. Uh, but hopefully I also can add a little bit into the mix today. Um, so, you know, let's, uh, let's, without further ado, start with a bit of an existential question. Um, who am I? <laughs> uh, you know, I thought I would begin uh, by sharing a little bit about myself since I'm, you know, not exactly a household name. I mean, Keith did a very nice job of introducing me, but uh, I, I do think this will give you a little bit of an idea as to why I chose the topic I did today, and uh, will also give you some idea of how I look at the world. Uh, and since I don't have a lot of time here, I'm uh, distilling myself down into five simple points. Um, I love stories and really always have. Uh, I started reading novels at a very early age and began collecting comic books at around age 10 and still going. Um, I pretty much geek out hard for anything Marvel. And as was mentioned, I am a part of a bona fide Danish poodle gang. <laughs> uh, I was born into a family with a one-year-old poodle, and I've owned and loved dogs ever since. Uh, I am currently the proud owner and very lucky to own uh, two members of that Danish poodle gang, uh, that is Biko and Kiba, and they accompany me to uh, work every single day. Quite lucky on that front, too. Uh, I dig technology and software and even did a bit of coding once upon a time. I got into computers pretty early on and have been interested in how innovation and digital technology impacts our lives, uh, you know, every day. Uh, I love architecture and interior design, but, you know, let's be frank for a moment. My dreams of becoming an architect were dashed when I realized you needed to be good at math, which I'm not. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it, it was also kind of a disappointment when I found out you couldn't just draw cool buildings all day long, that, you know, there was more to it than just that. But, you know, I am still drawn to the spatial realm and how buildings shape our lives. And as was mentioned, I am a formerly trained filmmaker and a theater performer. Uh, I worked in the industry for well over a decade, had my own company, and have a few films to my name and a handful of awards as well. Uh, I ended up leaving that industry because, well, uh, I was broke, uh, definitely the starving artist, which is what led me in a very roundabout way to design. Uh, I entered the design world with a pretty uh, naive take on things, but you know that did give me the opportunity to learn the ropes and question the rules. And uh, just a kind of fun fact, this building was actually uh, my very first environmental graphic design project. Uh, it was one of my first projects at my company, Forge Media and Design, which I helped found with my two business partners. And that's us there, as you can kind of tell. My hair is a little different. Uh, uh, and since then, we've actually built a very talented, uh, large interdisciplinary team, which has given us the ability to approach design in a very holistic way. And I work as the lead and creative director for our interactive team, which uh, you know, has a rather eclectic and strange menagerie of projects under our belt. Um, we can never really claim that we're bored because it's never the same twice. Um, you know, we have everything from educational video games in the form of fables, uh, all the way to large-scale digital art uh, installations. And uh, we actually have one going in literally in two days in the east end of Toronto, which we're quite excited and, you know, as you can expect, nervous about. <laughs> um, the one constant, no matter what the project is that we're working on, is the focus on innovation and narrative. So that's a little bit about me, but now let's get to the topic at hand and one which I'm actually really passionate about, which is, as you can probably surmise, story. Uh, you know, this is something which has been a big part of my personal journey and is the fulcrum of how I view life. So what is story? Stories have been critical to humankind for, you know, as long as recorded history and very frankly, quite like, likely anyways, long before that. Uh, they, are they are a constant in our human existence. They connect, they teach, they tug at the heartstrings, they convey meaning, and, you know, that list can go on and on and on, so much more. They sway our emotions and in many ways define our existence of the world, or at the very least, help us make sense of it. 
Now, a story is far more than just a sequence of events or a hero's narrative. Story is really all around us, and at its base, it's a form of communication, a way to reach others. As designers, what we create uh, and is really for the purpose of communication, and what we communicate, both on a visual but also on an emotional level, has the chance to impact our audience. And from an ethical stance, it takes discipline and thoughtfulness in the decision-making process for what a narrative conveys to its audience. I mean, we've heard about that all morning, and it is actually a very important aspect of design. Um, we, we have such a responsibility to the messages that we convey in our work. So what do I mean when I say honest stories? I mean, it's really not rocket science, okay? It's what it sounds like. It's very simply put, stories that put forth an honest and authentic narrative. They do not sensationalize or stray away from the original purpose behind them. You know, it's quite simple. But we're in a day and age where the rise of misinformation and disinformation is happening at a truly alarming rate. We don't have to look too far to find many examples of this at work. It's happening across all media channels, sometimes without us even recognizing it. So let's just quickly define these two terms because I think you know, often we can get them confused and it's just good to make sure that we're all on the same page. So disinformation is the deliberate creation and or sharing of false information in order to mislead. Misinformation is the act of sharing information without realizing that it's wrong. As designers and storytellers, we're much more likely to fall into the latter. I mean, unless we're sort of nefarious, we're probably not intentionally Disin using disinformation in our work, but it's very easy to fall into misinformation if we're not very thoughtful about the decisions that we're making to create narratives. You know, it's really becoming difficult to discern what's real and what isn't. Headlines are intentionally misleading to get us to click or to watch. The news itself has turned to an overuse of exaggeration and hyperbole that is really setting a tone for us that's, you know, putting us all on edge, right? Small news becomes big news with just a very small twist of the dial. Uh, for instance, turning a very, you know, we're heading into winter right now, uh, turning an average winter snowstorm into a snowpocalypse, right? We've all heard this one, maybe Snowmageddon. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's a better story, right? But is it real? Not usually. This is usually what we get when we hear about snowpocalypse. And there are exceptions to the rule, but too often uh, it actually isn't the case. But, we, you know, we've all been bitten by this particular one before, right? But we base our decisions on this kind of thing. It does have a direct impact on our lives. But there's nothing really wrong with a little harmless wordplay, right? Well, the thing is, we have to remember that words and images are extremely powerful, so we need to be careful how we use them. Personally, I think this rise in misinformation is having a quite significant impact on us as a society. I've seen it active in my own life, and I'm sure you can think of examples how it's affected you too. Our newspapers, media, and news feeds are stressing us out. You know, they're depressing us, and they're increasing our anxiety at a very rapid rate. You know, it may not be the only reason why this is happening, but we can't deny that it is actually playing a significant part. And really, this sort of storytelling is a shortcut. It's kind of lazy. It's easy to cry wolf or to make something small seem something big just to sell it. But let's not kid ourselves. It's still a deception. It sways us to think in a certain way, but when we find out what the real truth is, we feel cheated, right? The sort of, the thing is here that the truth about all of this is that honest storytelling in our narratives should actually be a part of our everyday design work or any other form of communication medium as it sets a precedent for an ethically based practice. You don't need to mislead your audience to tell a good or captivating story. So I want to share about a project we recently worked on, uh, which this particular subject matter actually came into a spotlight for us. Uh, the Holodomor Mobile Classroom is a literal vehicle in which students learn about human rights and uh, how the role of misinformation and disinformation 
played in covering up a man-made famine in 1930s Ukraine. If you haven't heard of it, it's not really that surprising because it was actually covered up for decades and is still actively being denied by many places. Canada is one of the few places where we actually recognize it as a true genocide. We built an engaging interactive lesson using a mixture of technology, uh, education material, experience design, and storytelling to help lift a history lesson out of the context of the standard brick and mortar school setting. We found new ways to share this very important story about social justice, one which, will, uh, one which actually now directly involves students and hopefully inspires them to think differently by the time that the lesson concludes. In many ways, this was an absolute dream project for us, but there were some real challenges to navigate from both a professional and personal ethical standpoint. For this project, we were working with our client, the Canada-Ukraine Foundation, as well as a well-regarded educator and author on the subject matter, as, and also the Toronto District School Board. From the outset, there were tensions between each of these groups that we had to help mediate to find a way to most appropriately handle the project. Add into this our own desire to make it an innovative piece of creative, and you can see that our target was getting much, much smaller and harder to hit we had to strike the perfect balance between all of these elements. Sounds easy, right? Well, no, that would be a big cup of nope. Absolutely not. It was very difficult. <laughs> as you can imagine, with such a sensitive subject matter as a genocide that has been covered up for decades, it's an emotional minefield. And for a project where the truth has been hidden for so long, you know, how do you even know what you're trying to communicate is correct? Uh, it does beg the question of what the real truth is. And that question did arise for us as a team while we were working on this. But what we came to the conclusion of was it really wasn't our place to discern what the real truth is. And I know that sounds a bit strange, but really what it comes down to is we weren't in a position to know that or even find that out. There were people out there that were doing all of that work, and some of the people we were working with were those individuals. Our job was to actually represent the story that the client wanted us to tell, in effect, to embody their truth. The goal of the project was to share Ukraine's position on the subject. So that's exactly what we did. Now, uh, yeah, and I was really glad that Patty actually had a Spider-Man uh, moment in there because I have a few of these in my deck. <laughs> I told you I was a Marvel fan. Um, being mindful of our decisions from the outset was absolutely critical. We, we, you know, we had to set the ultimate project goal and stick with it. Um, and that was really critical for us. Mindfulness is such an important aspect of making wise decisions throughout a process, particularly one that's you know, lengthy. And it will end up helping you and your team stay focused on the guidelines that you set out for yourself. It's you know, a great discipline to master, period. And you know, really, it will actually at the bottom line, help you to create authentic stories uh, you know, that are very tried and true to the original material. As with any project, we had to start by listening to a client. And they shared a bit about uh, who they were, both as an organization and as a culture, because uh, Ukraine has a very specific culture and we were not really aware of it. It was our first interaction uh, with people um, like that. Uh, you know, and, we did actually have a Ukrainian working for us at the time, um, and so she was also helpful in sort of figuring out how to uh, navigate this. They outlined the parameters of the project for us and what they wanted to achieve, to achieve with it. Uh, so when we started to formulate how best to encapsulate all of this into a solid platform for them to use, uh, you know, it really started to come down to uh, how, what do we do with it, right? You know, how do we actually uh, approach this? And, you know, if there's one thing which I could share with you today, which I think, you know, some creatives need to hear, not everyone, but some definitely do, it's this. It's not about you. You know, as designers, I think sometimes we get ahead of ourselves and, you know, the creative decision-making process, and we end up putting that ahead of our clients' needs. And we want to make it, you know, beautiful and engaging. And we may even be altruistic about these things. We, you know, we want to push our ideas. We want to push ourselves to the limits. We may even want to put a specific aesthetic that we think is appropriate for it, but 
really, that also may even be what the client wants. But the thing is, is in terms of that mindfulness, we have to actually remember this. It's their material, it's their persona, it's their brand, whatever it is that you're working on, it's them. You know, they fear more than anything else, and this comes from a lot of uh, interactions with clients over the years, they fear that you're gonna walk away with their material and create something that is not them. You know, it's not representative of who they are. And that can happen very easily. You know, first, we actually have to get them to trust us. And that's not something we can just expect. You know, I think there is also this thing of, like, if I work for a big agency or if I'm, you know, I think of myself as a great designer, we sort of get into that mindset of uh, letting somebody else kind of, you know, they, they should think of us that way. But realistically, they don't actually owe us anything. <laughs> Um, and really, when it comes down to it, they have to actually trust us to be able to do the project properly. Otherwise, you're going to end up in fights for you know, the duration of the project, trying to convince them to go a specific way. It should be much more symbiotic. And what we realize, too, is that we're trying to interpret their material into a new form. And this is a really key point. We're interpreters, not authors. I think sometimes we get into this, and this may even just be my background as a filmmaker, and I was a director and screenwriter and performer, so definitely something which I had to contend with when I switched gears into the design world. It's not authorship. You're actually trying to interpret the work uh, in a new format for them. For us, we were taking a well-planned uh, traditional history lesson that had been worked on for years and transform it into a digital experience. The educator was absolutely terrified that we were going to take her life's work and destroy it. And that happened from the very first meeting with her. And it really was, it took a lot of time for us to navigate that and show her uh, that we were not interested in changing her material. We were literally taking it, making it the core, and wrapping it in a new format. It was not going to lose the educational mandate. And eventually this was understood with a lot of coaxing and also showing her, literally showing her how we were going to do this. And she started to relax and it became a much better relationship for the duration of the project. You know, it's been my experience that during projects like the Holodomore Mobile Classroom that creating something authentic kind of ends up at odds with our own creative ambitions at times. Uh, this is usually more of something that you actually deal with, uh, you know, internally, which is why the sort of inner conflict, um, than the one that you deal with with your clients. I mean, effectively, it's you versus you. Any creative will tell you it's very natural to want to put your own stamp on something that you're working on. I mean, I don't think any of us here are particularly interested in phoning it in. You know, it's not why we got into design. For me, it's always a goal to push myself uh, and push the conceptual work as far as it can go, push myself and my team to create something that has artistic merit at the end of the day. Um, you know, really, what we want to do is, is you know, give the best product, and that's, from an ethical standpoint, really good. But if we lose sight of the fact that uh, you know, we need to actually have the core content held intact, you know, you're going to end up in this tug of war, this constant battle with yourself. And we want to make sure that we don't stray away from that target. So that tug of war, that's you know, the fight uh, game kind of a connotation here, um, it's, it's between that creative drive that you have and the goal of remaining true to that message. Too far to one side of that equation, and you're very likely to go down that route of misrepresentation, and you don't want that. But on the other side, if you stay too true to the original source material, you may actually lose the opportunity to really impact your audience. So there is a tension that uh, has to exist between these two elements. And I think sometimes we think of tension as a bad thing, but really sometimes it's a necessary thing. And then this is one of those cases. Sometimes finding that razor's edge between two opposing forces can actually provide you with the best result. And finding that balance point between authenticity and creativity is a critical aspect of honest storytelling. So a little bit of audience participation here. Let me ask you, who here had a really great teacher? Doesn't matter whether it was in you know, grade school all the way to university, who, hands up, who had like a fantastic teacher that you just remember? 
Great. Okay. So let me ask. Um, I'm going to pick you because you're right here. <laughs> um, what was it about them that was fantastic? Yep. Right. It was relatable. Right. Okay. So that's actually really helpful, and I'm glad it worked out in the first one <laughs> for time. Um, but it really comes down to this. The hallmarks of good teaching methodology or even a memorable story is that it's humanized, that it's relatable, just what you said. It's that it's engaging and, you know, remains educational. And some of these, you know, movies are great examples of that was the whole purpose of that movie was that there was a different methodology attached to the teaching and it reached the students. You know, in making the changes of how you want to approach the material but not changing the material itself, that's really what it comes down to. This is exactly what we've done with the Holodomor Muggle Classroom. Both lessons were intended to teach students about the topic but if we hadn't applied a new teaching methodology to it, it's very likely that it would have fallen flat and it wouldn't have reached its objective. So the key here, as I've been saying, is that it's that finding that balance point, keeping the message clean and clear and learnable, but finding a new way in which to engage the audience with it. Now, students are growing up in a media-saturated swipe and skim world. If you are going to try and force them to sit through a history lesson uh, that simply talks at them for the duration of the presentation, you're not likely going to connect with them, right? So what we ended up doing was we used interactive technology inside an immersive environment and found ways to express the message using familiar media language that would meet the students where they lived, while it also complemented the educational content and themes. You know, we found a cohesive through line that helped tie the entire thing together. The heart of our second lesson, there's two lessons now for the bus, uh, and this one's entitled Breaking the Sound Barrier. Um, and it's all about teaching the students about the Holodomor first, but then giving them an artistic outlet to express themselves in the latter half. Uh, they are given time to collectively create their own collage called the Wall of Truth. This is an example of it here. Uh, which aims to raise awareness and combat the pervasive disinformation about the Holodomor, while also teaching the students to become uh, active global citizens. The first portion of the lesson needed to provide a really quick introduction to the history of the Holodomor, covering what the first lesson did in a fraction of the time. Uh, you know, not all students get to see both lessons, so it was important for us to be able to set the context correctly for them. But in the first lesson, we had 60 minutes to actually teach them about the Holodomor, and in this one, we had five. So that's actually a pretty tall order. And so we decided to rely on a narrated animation to tell the story using an art style that was rep reminiscent of some of the Soviet propaganda at the time, uh, that was seen at the time. Um, this was paired with iPads that provided students historical information in a dynamic timeline that would advance along with the film. This gave us two tools with uh, which we could teach the students. One, in the hands of the students, literally giving them historical information via photos, facts, and definitions, uh, while the animation painted the picture of the situation in a memorable way. Uh, this tied into the artful themes of the overall lesson. The art was sort of a pervasive theme in terms of how to combat misinformation, one route that you can do that um, in a very engaging and creative way. Uh, but it also maintained the historical aspects. One of the things that came up during this uh, particular part of the process with the educator was she was very nervous that the animation on its own would actually you know, misrepresent or possibly just um, trivialize it. And that was something we were very hyper aware of, but she had sort of forgotten that we had these iPads in the students' hands. And it was something, as a traditional educator, she wasn't thinking about the students having something. And we treated the iPads very much um, like textbooks in a way that was feeding information. I mean, the one thing about this is we can dynamically, as certain points of the animation hit, we were sending signals out to all of the iPads. There's 32 of them. Uh, and it was actually catching up and giving them information, just you know, feeding it to them as they needed. It, they couldn't swipe 
forward so they couldn't advance and like get distracted. They had to sort of pay attention. They could go backwards though. If they, if they missed something, they could actually scroll back, but it kept them sort of from advancing too far. You put iPads on students' hands, it also tends to actually cause a lot of disruption. So you have to be very careful with that. Um, and believe me, these things are locked down like airtight, like Fort Knox airtight. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not particularly a fan of rules. Um, and you know, it's a bit of honesty here. I, I just, I'm not, a, I never have been. And it's part of the reason I think why I ended up in the creative field. I'm usually one trying to find the loophole when I'm being told to do something in a specific way to handle it differently or show that there can be a different way to actually uh, approach it. Uh, but there is always exceptions to rules. And so what I'm giving you today really isn't rules. And I don't want you to think of them as rules. It's just simply advice and take from it what you can and leave the rest behind. That's fine. But if there is one thing which I actually can teach you today uh, and, and share with you, um, it's this. Find freedom in accepting limitations. Uh, this kind of bait dates back to my time working with actors, um, which is a totally, it's not too dissimilar to working with students, actually. Uh, <laughs> there were times when they wanted to break free from the script and make it their own. Sounds a little familiar, right? Um, they wanted to add their own personal stamp to the character, and really there's nothing wrong with this in particular, but... Uh, and, and it certainly can actually help you find a way to something better, but more often than not, what actually happens is you lose sight of the original intent of the character or sometimes even the script itself. I mean, you wouldn't do this with Shakespeare, right? You wouldn't go, oh, you know, I'm just going to improvise my way through the to be or not to be kind of uh, content here and just make up my own thing. Um, but what we can do with Shakespeare and Stratford and a lot of other places within the world do this is they actually wrap it in a new era or set it in a new setting, and it actually gives new context or can give new context to the piece. Um, and that's really kind of what I'm getting at here. Uh, what really is sort of the crux here is all too often I think we find ourselves like when someone's told us we can't do something a specific way or they've given us very strict kind of parameters to work within, we feel like our creative wings are clipped. But I think with a very small adjustment to our thinking, we can actually, uh, you know, really discover that we can find freedom in these kinds of limitations. So how many here have actually been working on a project uh, whether car where they get carte blanche? I mean, this may not be your clients. Very few clients will give you carte blanche, but maybe it's your own personal project. You sit down, you set yourself up with your computer, and you stare at a blank screen, and you don't know where to go. You know, you freeze, essentially, and you, you're kind of like, okay, so not sure what to do with this, and I'm not even sure what's going to hit the right note. And, I, and you kind of end up in this, like, loop of, well, but if, if I do this, oh, this idea, okay, but if I do that, they're not going to like it because of this, and you, you don't have any feedback. So sometimes it can actually be much harder to design something when the options are that wide open. There are times when providing boundaries actually can really help free your creativity and it does allow us to make more streamlined choices uh, and that will actually get the ball rolling, right? So what you may find instead of looking to the horizon for the solutions that you can actually dig down and add a lot of depth to the material instead. You know, when we work within a client's mandate, be it educational or otherwise, this definitely does come into effect. They're the ones that are providing the walls for us uh, that we must work within, whether verbally or not. You know, if you're working within a brand, there's a set of guidelines that you kind of have to work with. Um, but it's also you know, harkening back to that thing where we are trying to represent who they are, the story that they want to tell. The thing is, is that doesn't need to hinder us creatively. It's a bit like Lego. Uh, so not so much these loose blocks, that's maybe a bit more like improvisation. I'm talking about those sets you buy where you're creating something like the Batmobile or, uh, you know, Hogwarts Castle um, or the Death Star. <laughs> uh, if you were to buy a set and try to build it without following the instructions, you're probably not going to end up with what you were intending to end up with. It's going to be a bit of a mess. I mean, let's face it, those things can be a bit complicated. Um, it's really no different when we attempt to meet the criteria of a client without coloring within the lines. Okay, so within a client's context, it's probably more like IKEA instructions and less like Lego instructions, um, but I think you get my point. 
don't think of it as restrictive. It doesn't need to be that. You aren't being hogtied here. Let the parameters you must work within challenge you and free your creativity instead. So, as much as this is about your client's mandate, and we've been talking about that a lot, there is also another side to the coin of this. It's, uh, the thing is, at the end of the day, you have to be mindful of the end goal, which is making the project engaging for your audience. And clients aren't always good at knowing when that is actually the case. They all get very blinded by the fact that their material is awesome. And the thing is, is that sometimes it's not the most approachable for the audience. The material itself can be great. And then that was the case for us with the Haldemore Mobile Classroom. The material was great, but it was a traditional history lesson. And I don't know about you, but I slept through most of my history lessons. So <laughs> we had to find a way to meet the kids where they were, as I said before. And, you know, if we're, if we're trying to use it as is, we're, we're definitely not going to hit the mark. Um, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the viewer. And we, we heard this in uh, not just the last talk, I think in all of the talks we talked about this. And this is because it's basically user experience or experience design 101. You put yourself in the shoes of the individual who is going to be engaging with it in the shoes of the audience. And that way you will know that you're going to hit the right chord or at least have a better chance of doing it. Your client's not always going to know how to approach this. They're going to actually, you know, potentially even be quite adamant that their material is fine as it is. And we may actually have to try to convince them kindly <laughs> to, uh, to realize that maybe that's not the case and that they need to actually reformat it. If we don't make it memorable, What's the point? The teaching methodology that we talked about earlier comes into play here. To create a deeply resonant user experience, you have to make it impactful for, uh, for the audience in a way that is going to you know, stick in their brain or even better, actually imprint on their heart. Humanizing the information makes really all the difference uh, for learning and memory retention. And there are three key ingredients to doing this. Uh, I've actually recently watched this uh, TV, uh, well, Netflix series called The Mind Explained. Have you guys, have you guys watched this? Yeah. No? I really highly recommend it. This is actually a really great series. And the very first episode is actually about memory. And it was one of those times where you're sitting there and something gets validated. I mean, I'm just a creative. What do I know? But there's neuroscientists basically saying something which I have actually suspected is the case for years. And it was a little nice to have that inner validation. Um, and it's this. The equation goes... Story and emotion and place equal memorable. If it strikes a strong emotional chord, whatever that might entail, if there is a significant sense of time and place and we can attach a familiar narrative structure to it, then we're much more likely to remember, uh, form a stronger memory of it. The byproduct of this is that the audience is very likely more uh, likely to learn better from it and experience, you know, especially from an experience which actually contains all three elements. And, you know, it's really important to recall that how we present the information is just as important as the information itself. As designers, we have to choose that path. And good user experience design packages that information up in ways which are engaging and will ensure that we learn and retain what we've learned long after that initial engagement. So, you know, sometimes you can't do a thing. <laughs> very specific, but I love it because it's actually very true. Within a complex project such as this, you may find that you come up against practical challenges, and we certainly did. Um, and, it, and those practical challenges actually have an impact, a deep potentially impact, on the authenticity of the messaging. Uh, in this example, um, which is directly from the second lesson, we had created that wall of truth uh, template, and it was using... Um, square and rectangular imagery on a grid, uh, set, you know, horizontally and vertically. Um, but that grid was there for a very practical, excuse me, a practical reason. Um, you know, it was there because it was easy for the students to engage with it. Those that weren't feeling too artistic weren't going to end up actually disengaging. It was a way to actually be expressive. 
But it was also a way to end up with a very pleasing collage at the end of the lesson and not just sort of a jumbled mess. If we'd done it very freeform and we did just some user testing with that, it just ended up being, you know, a lot of the time, especially with students who weren't that interested, were just kind of like dragging stuff in and then done. And, um, you know, so this was for a very practical reason, but some of the imagery that was provided to us was actually very important historical photographs of the Holodomor. So what happens when you apply one of these to our template? Well, we ran into issues where the meaning of the image actually shifted rather than you know, rolling with it. Sometimes we actually had to decide not to use it in that way. And you know, the idea was to actually have all images available in all formats. There was many different formats. And there were some images which we just couldn't do that with. Um, and, you know, and sometimes we actually just shipped it to that one template alone. In this case, we see you know, a bunch of farmers, and it looks pretty, you know, it's not exactly cheery, but it doesn't seem too bad. But what's really happening here? Huh, that's a little different, isn't it? You know, you have a soldier pointing at them, basically telling them what to do. It doesn't look so idyllic anymore. So as you can see, sometimes the direction that you set out for yourself can have a direct impact on the content itself. You need to find ways to work around it and or find ways to actually communicate the same message in a slightly different way. So this kind of goes back to the mindfulness thing. Uh, one of the most important things that we found on a project like this is that we have to, uh, you know, we found that checking in often was critical to maintaining that focus. Um, you know, and it was really actually critical for us to be uh, accountable to everybody, not just ourselves as a team, not just uh, myself personally, but to the client as well. I mean, honest assessment on a project like this, it doesn't come from a single source. Uh, these projects have a lot of different angles to them. They're very complex and they actually are very long. You know, this one was actually about a year and a half working on it. And um, so it's rather difficult for any single source to cover all of the bases. So, you know, and often we actually are kind of our own worst enemy um, and wanting to either, you know, secretively or subconsciously or sometimes just, you know, inadvertently slipping back into our own comfort zones. And that can actually lead us astray from those targeted goals that we set out for ourselves. Establishing consistent timelines, milestones within the process to actually uh, take a step back and assess the situation with the team, with your client, with yourself, whatever it may need, is actually one way that you're going to stick to those guiding principles and ensure that you remain authentic to the original source material. And I'm sure this is one which actually... Uh, you know, everyone has dealt with it at some point in time, but sometimes it's actually difficult for the client to remain, you know, solid and focused on that, you know, big picture at the end of the day. Um, they may struggle keeping focus because, you know, it's a long time. They're not you know, really, they're not usually as involved on a day-to-day -day basis as you are. So there, there's gaps in time, and that's actually usually when they may end up flipping back into their own comfort zones or start losing the faith on what you're actually trying to do, um, or just forget things, frankly. Um, you know, they're not usually the ones to actually be able to kind of pull their heads out. So from an ethical standpoint, really, this is a kindness that you need to do where you may actually have to put your arm around them, shepherd them back into the fold, and say, that, you know, reorient them as to why decisions were being made. You may, it's, it's, look, it's frustrating. I'm not actually going to lie. Sometimes it's extremely frustrating when you have to do this over and over again. But the thing is, is, if we don't do this, we don't end up on the same page, and we're not actually doing our jobs as designers. As interpreters, this is part of what we actually have to do. And really, at the end of the day, when you actually finish, you want everyone to be on the same page. You don't want you over here and them over there, and you know, no one's happy with the final solution. So as designers, you know, we carry that responsibility, which we've talked about quite a bit today, to design ethically and have the power to sway an audience with the tools available to us. And our tool set has really evolved beyond just color and shape. With experience design, our kit has expanded quite significantly through texture and sound, interaction, time, you name it, it's all there. Uh, and so many others are actually part of it and it's constantly evolving. Um, all the possibilities are kind of open for us, but it's also making it that much more important that we are in full control of them. 
you know, our influence on emotions, on thoughts and behavior can always really swing to that negative side of things so easily, and especially if we're being careless. Instead, I would really encourage you to use them to share honest stories with the world so that we can turn the tide against the onslaught of misinformation. Create narratives that will heal, teach, and reveal. But most of all, I hope that you create stories that can be trusted. Thanks. <laughs>